Hi, folks. Hope you had a nice lunch. We're the uh, post-lunch <laughs> portion of this uh, presentation. And what we wanted to do with this panel discussion is sort of drill down on the issues that affect us, no matter if you're a large city, a moderate city, a smaller city, and what the common issues are, and then what are the solutions. And in fact, a lot of times this isn't cookie cutter. It isn't always one size fits all, but there are programs and there are people out there who have been able to solve some of the problems that Pittsburgh's facing right now. Uh, with us are two of my favorite mayors, uh, Mayor Garrett from Wilkinsburg, Mayor Schaff from Oakland, yeah, California. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> The reason that they've been asked to participate is they work, both of them, through solution-based problem solving. Um, they take a very thoughtful position to the issues that are facing us. Many times those issues go all the way and drill into emotion, and they come back using data and facts and work in building consensus in order to be able to take on some really sensitive issues. So with that, uh, let's just jump in because M Mayor Schaff, you've been seeing quite a bit of gentrification that's been occurring in Oakland. The, the San Francisco uh, market is now saturated and it's moving across the bay into Oakland. Uh, Pittsburgh is starting to see that as well. After 50 years of decline, there's now areas of this city where we can actually measure where the gentrification is happening. And earlier we had the opportunity to see data showing us where we should be concerned. How do you approach it? I mean, how do you approach it from both a local government and then how do you approach it as a leader in order to be able to work with the people in the community to deal with all the effects that gentrification has, not just the displacement of housing, but across the board? Um, do we have an hour? <laughs> 42 <laughs> minutes. Um, you know, when I became the mayor, uh, two studies came out in my first year. One, I was shocked to find out that Oakland, California was the fourth most expensive city in the country to rent a two-bedroom apartment in. And second, that not only did we have one of the fastest rising cost of living, but relative to the rise in income, we literally had the most out of whack dynamics going on of any city in America. Um, and, you know, I put, I did what mayors do, you know, put some of the smartest, most passionate people in a room together and said, you've got six months to figure this out and give me my plan. And they came out with, um, we call it the 17K, 17K plan. And I love how you are talking about not just place and planet, but people in this conference. Because so often when we talk about the housing crisis, we talk in terms of units and building units. And uh, you know, I followed Jerry Brown. If anybody uh, remembered Jerry Brown as the mayor of Oakland, as opposed to as the governor of California, he had this uh, 10K plan, but it's all about units. Um, 17K first is to protect 17,000 families from being displaced from the city. So we put people first. Now part of doing that was to also produce 17K more units of housing with a goal that most of them would be affordable, protected affordable housing. But because we put people first, we really took on strengthening our renter protections. Um, looking for ways to actually acquire existing market rate housing and put affordability protections on them so that you're not just increasing your supply of affordable housing, you're actually protecting people from displacement uh, at the same time. You're doing it quickly, faster than you're able to build. Uh, I went to the voters and asked them to pass a bond. And uh, this bond measure passed by 82.4% of the vote. Is that incredible? These people voted to raise their own taxes. Uh, <laughs> um, and you know, $100 million uh, in there was for affordable housing. And again, with the preference of this acquisition strategy, which is really an anti-displacement strategy. Now, I think part of how I got it passed was I also promised that there's some money in there to fix the roads, 
fix up some of our parks and libraries. I think sometimes people are afraid to put multiple issues into a single bond measure, but I actually think that's why this one was so wildly successful. We also adopted impact fees. Um, Oakland is, for the first time, seeing institutional investors coming and actually just creating a building boom like we have never seen. I, literally, my skyline is just full of construction cranes. Uh, we not only will have a record number of units built this year, we literally will triple the previous record. I, I will build almost 3,700 new units of housing in a single year but most of those are luxury. So we uh, did the legal study that allows us to charge a fee for every one of those units that goes into our affordable housing uh, construction fund. Or alternatively, the builders can include an affordable unit in the building. Now, I, I wanna get off housing for a second because part of gentrification is not just um, trying to keep the price of uh, living down, but it's also about lifting up the people that are in your city and allowing them to be able to afford the new higher cost of living. Uh, I am a huge advocate of raising the minimum wage. So Oakland did its own raising of the minimum wage and then um, the late Ed Lee and I were co-chairs of a campaign that helped get California's minimum wage raised. We were, the first, we were the first state to actually have a $15 minimum wage for the whole state of California. Um, I can go, I, I, again, I told you I needed an hour to talk about <laughs> this. Um, we also have partnered with uh, Kiva.org. I don't know if anyone's ever made a, a loan, a microloan on Kiva. Um, we have closed more than 530 microloans to, you know, homegrown entrepreneurs that would never qualify for a, a typical commercial loan. These are zero interest loans. They are funded by you know, us, the bank of the community, because they're crowdsourced. And um, talk about uh, disrupting uh, institutionalized racism. These loans, 70% uh, were to women-owned businesses and 90% to businesses owned by people of color, 90%. And then I'll stop here, but if you want to ask me later, uh, the other big bet that we're making in Oakland is something called the Oakland Promise that we believe will triple the number of Oakland public school students who get a college degree. Uh, right now, last year, when we looked back at the ninth grade class uh, that had been out of high school for six years, only 15% of them had earned a college degree. And Oakland is in Silicon Valley. The jobs are there. And it is shameful that we are not giving our incredible, brilliant students what they need to enjoy the prosperity that is all around us. And then I'll just say one more thing and then I'll shut up. <laughs> I'm not stopping you. Okay. I'm um, taking notes. <laughs> Gentrification in Oakland, and, and I don't know if this is true in your cities or not, but it's part of a regional dynamic. And so when you're thinking about solving a problem in your city, sometimes you've got to look outside your city. The Bay Area as a whole has, for the last two decades, been adding eight new jobs for every one new unit of housing that has gotten built. And, and so this dynamic has happened outside of my city. Um, cities that have made decisions to welcome, you know, a new Apple campus and build not a single new unit of affordable housing. That's impacting Oakland, even though that decision was made somewhere else. And so I am taking a much more aggressive role uh, in our regional governance bodies that hands out transportation funding. I'm up in Sacramento, like trying to slap around our legislators and wake them up to what we need. So I'm really, um, you know, taking it outside my city because um, I recognize that that is what is impacting the quality of life of the people I serve. There's a lot of similarities between Oakland and Pittsburgh. 
uh, and going back throughout our entire lifetimes. Yeah. Um, it's just that now watching the growth that is occurring there, there is a multitude of lessons that we can learn. Um, one of the areas that has been most hard hit in the economic collapse of the 1980s has been Wilkinsburg. Um, my family used to have a Texaco station in Wilkinsburg. They had moved it from Homewood to Wilkinsburg in the 1950s. My dad used to work there. I remember Wilkinsburg when Penn Avenue was vibrant. Um, it's, it's not that way right now. There's uh, the economic collapse that has had an effect on it. The, the symptoms of poverty are all around. As you look in there dealing with these issues, Mary, what are your solutions? What are the problems that you face that are the most prevalent? And then what are the ways that you are actively solving them? Thank you. So I might be trying to adjust my mic as we do this, but um, so one of the main things about Wilkinsburg, and especially for you audience members who are familiar with Wilkinsburg, there's a perception issue. A lot of people sometimes I see on Facebook or you know, anytime the news media comes out, it's when there's been a homicide or something bad has happened. And sadly, that's a given. We don't see them for um, our street fest. We don't see them when we have our park recreation program. So that's kind of the first kind of uh, aim that I take and then tackling the rest because in my role now as mayor previously I served on council for the past four years so it's very much a part of that legislative body making sure that we are creating rules regulations and ordinances to protect and um, empower our community but now in the role of mayor especially for a smaller city technically borough of about 16,000 people I need to also be their biggest cheerleader so I need to make sure that our residents also know the great things that are going on so that first starts with that perception issue it starts with you know stopping people calling Wilkinsburg Wilkinsburg and all of those different things and thinking that you know there's a shooting there every day and um, last year 2017 one homicide is one too many there were two homicides for the whole year so Wilkinsburg is a place that is for the most part relatively safe and that's not in any part just by me or one person that's through everyone working together. We still have a very strong sense of community, tight knit, that uh, Dr. Perry had referenced a little bit earlier um, this morning. And so in that, kind of changing that perception of, okay, we're not, you know, just poor. We went through economic uh, disadvantages between the crack epidemic, white flight, all of these different things, but here we are, and we are very much a borough, a city of opportunity where we can really build from our own assets to build true inclusive community development. So in my role of mayor in Wilkinsburg, it's about connecting our residents, making sure they understand that their social change agents and that it's not one person who's going to, you know, quote unquote, save or help Wilkinsburg. It's going to be all of us together. It's going to be borough working with um, our community development cor corporation, working with the school district, working with the churches. It's going to take all of um, that. So even in my campaign, when I said, you know, I want to move Wilkinsburg forward, but I can't do this by myself. I need everyone coming to council meetings. So how I combat or kind of create those solutions is community engagement, going to the community, going to the residents. What do you want to see? You want more green spaces in this area? You're concerned about some of the crime or maybe activities there? Let's start some block watches. Join a planning commission. All of our, one thing that I'm really, really proud about is all of our authorities, committees, and boards are um, filled by residents. So whenever there's a new project or capital planning that's coming to the borough, it goes through the residents and then it goes to council. Even right now with the redevelopment of our train station, which has uh, been vacant for the past 40 years, the county uh, thankfully gave ownership to the borough and now we're leasing it to our community development corporation. So it's really strengthening those partnerships within our community that we already have, but even more so, we have to empower and we have to educate our residents. Change is scary. Sometimes it is easier thinking, you know, hey, things will never change. This is Wilkinsburg. We should just be okay with what we have. But it's not. 
It's not. We can no longer be just that. It's just Wilkinsburg. Anything can go there. No. So what we need to do and in the role of what I want to do is make sure that, again, our residents know the voice and the part that they play in this. You, first of all, vote us in. You can vote us out. But we also need your voices at everything. So especially with the talks of gentrification and displacement, there's immediately an idea that that's coming right down the pipeline to Wilkinsburg because it's right down Penn Avenue. But every community is different. In Wilkinsburg, over 18% of our housing stock is blighted and vacant. So that equates to about 800 parcels. So we need growth to continue to further development in Wilkinsburg. If we stay 16,000 people, then we're just gonna stay where we're at right now. So where growth can be scary for other places, we need that and it's crucial to our true revitalization of the borough. So just as Oakland is looking and in creating incentive programs in order to create affordability um, and seeing the greatest growth since probably 100 years ago, what is Wilkinsburg do, doing in order to be able to not only entice housing growth and population growth, but understanding that there's a whole changing economy happening two miles away. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of youth that might not have an opportunity for all these jobs that would be created. Both of you are very powerful leaders in looking at inclusivity and innovation. I know you have a term for it. We call it inclusive innovation in Pittsburgh, but there's a term in Oakland. But what are you doing at Wilkinsburg in order to be able to to see opportunity for all with this change. Yeah, happening. so the very first thing, because I know anytime I say where I'm from, Wilkinsburg, immediately taxes come up. That's the biggest thing. Oh, your tax is so high, your taxes are high. And that is true. We do have the highest school taxes in the county, second highest um, in the state as of two years ago. So the very first thing we do, understanding that we have a high uh, tax millage and just it didn't happen overnight how we got there, so it's not necessarily going to happen overnight to reduce it. But we offer different incentives and programming, not only for people who want to come into the community, but for homeowners who need assistance with their uh, current property. So one thing is we do a five-year commercial and tax abatement program where you will work with um, our tax collector and also our community development corporation to get into that program so you can purchase a property, do the necessary repairs, pairs or bring it up to code how you need to without worrying about our high taxes for the first five years. Then after that five year period is um, up, then you work with our tax collector MBM and they get you to a point where um, you know you get caught up, but you don't have to immediately pay back those five years right away. Second thing is we have a tax amnesty forgiveness program. So for our residents who need to be on a payment plan for the taxes, once they've fulfilled a certain amount, we forgive the rest because we don't want to penalize our residents even more for fiscal irresponsibility that occurred in past administrations. Also, one thing I want to add, and I'll get to the inclusive part, is when we talk about gentrification, sometimes I feel like when we're talking about gentrification, we're, we need to specifically say displacement because that's where a lot of the negative effects are coming. So one thing in Wilkinsburg, we've actually, in a way, 20 years ago, when our taxes started going high, we displaced ourselves. But sometimes we think that it's gonna be a big box retailer that's gonna come in and displace us when essentially it could be the wrong leadership that we had for 20 years and to where people had to leave their homes. Even if their homes were paid off, you still have these high taxes. So we need to really understand what we're talking about. Now back to the part about um, inclusivity and jobs and opportunities. I think a lot of times, sometimes if you're not linked in, you get scared of certain terminology. So sometimes when we say words like technology, we say innovation or different things. For those who may not be plugged into that, what does that mean? It kind of just like this cloud. What, what are we talking about? So last night, um, an initiative that I started a few years ago called Wilkinsburg Community Conversations, where we really just want to connect residents together to work together, sit down, have a conversation, what's happening in our region, but even more so, how can we work with you all to create real solutions to improve our neighborhood? So last night, we had a discussion about the tech boom 
boom in the Berg, our region. And when we say that, how is that actually creating inclusive jobs and opportunities? And so we had speakers from Prototype Pittsburgh, a feminist makerspace, Google Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Tech Council, Work Hard Pittsburgh and Beta Builders. And the first step is just sharing that information. Having a conversation can change the culture, which eventually can change the narrative of our landscape. So letting people know that, hey, you can go to Academy Pittsburgh and you can participate in a coding boot camp. Although it's intensive, when you leave out of there, you'll have so many skills that can immediately plug you into a job where you're making over $60,000. I can guarantee you about 80% of the attendees there last night never heard about it, never heard of programs like Moms Can Code, never heard about beta builders, which really focuses on high school students getting them involved in that. So we need to make, when we're making tech a priority, we need to make sure that we're making it a priority for everyone and educating everyone up to the same level, because not everyone's on the same fair playing level. One of my favorite stories that I've heard about the opportunities that are being created in the city comes from the Energy Innovation Center. Um, one of the classes that they're teaching is teaching young men how to be able to install and work with solar energy. And that requires math skills. And for a lot of people, they haven't been in high school for a while. The math skills erode. So one of the exercises they have to do is former students come back with their pay stubs and they have to work to determine from that pay stub what the annual salary of the former students are. And as I've been told by Rich DeClaudio there, people will cry when they realize that they're on a path to be able to make $40,000. And they're being shown it by the people that sat in their seat two years ago. Um, you, you're doing wonderful things in Oakland and I remember from one of the times we were together in San Francisco and we had never talked about it before but we were, both said that there's this coming of all this technology and uh, innovation of a new economy and then there's the other side of making sure that you're designing it for all and you had a term for it and I can't remember it. Tequity. 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 Tell us about Tequity. <laughs> Well, Tequity, for me, uh, it's, it's one of those great terms because it can mean whatever you want it to mean. Um, but this, this term kind of got play when uh, Uber decided to move its headquarters into Oakland. And, um, you know, they, of course, they asked me for a tax break. I said no. Um, maybe that's a sore subject to bring up. <laughs> they didn't even bother to ask. <laughs> Um, I, I really think cities have got to stop um, on this race to the bottom where we're prostituting ourselves yeah, to... And, and just so people know, Libby's proven it. I'm a lifelong Oakland resident who would not capitulate to the Oakland Raiders and the Oakland Raiders will be moving to Las Vegas. They will, so they called my bluff, but um, you know, sometimes you lose well. Yeah. And, and I felt like, uh, no, I don't need to subsidize billionaires out of my people's tax dollars. <laughs> um, but similarly, uh, you know, we, I said, no, I'm not giving you a tax break, but they decided to come anyway. They bought a major building in my downtown, and, um, you know, this was before they really <laughs> were being seen as a very, somewhat a, uh, having an unsavory culture. <laughs> but I wrote them a letter, because, you know, as I, I hate to tell you all this, but we actually don't control everything that goes on in our cities, yeah. uh, particularly the disposition of private property. Uh, but what we do have is kind of the power of the bully pulpit. And so I wrote them a letter that magically found its way into the press all over the place, um, saying, you know, kind of welcome to Oakland, now behave yourself. Um, and here are my expectations of you. And, and, and that's kind of what I call tequity. So number one, you have got to face up to the fact that the tech sector does not look like America. Uh, it is too white, it is too male. And I expect you to play an active role 
acknowledging that and fixing that. Secondly, I want you to be um, a part of our local economy. We are also the headquarters of Pandora. And Pandora brags about the fact that they do not have a corporate cafeteria. They want their workers to go out and support the mom and pop restaurants and cafes and bars that are in their neighborhood. Yay, yay Pandora, subscribe today. Oh, shameless <laughs> plug. Um, and so for example, with Uber and, and the, the irony is I got all the buzz of Uber supposedly moving to Oakland and then they had all their trouble and then they sold their building and decided not to move to Oakland. So I got all the buzz and none of the problems. Uh, but in the meantime, when they were trying to kind of win over the community, instead of buying their coffee from a major supplier, I introduced them to Red Bay Coffee in Oakland. It's a workers' cooperative uh, and its employees are almost entirely formally incarcerated and their coffee is amazing. Uh, and, and now Uber actually is still using Red Bay Coffee even though they ended up not coming to Oakland. And that contract alone had a huge impact on the number of new jobs that was added to Red Bay Coffee. So buy local, think about, I call it impact purchasing. Where are you getting your services? Where are you getting your products? Support not just local businesses, but also social innovation businesses. So socially, we, we have a lot of uh, B Corps, beneficial corporations in Oakland. So be mindful of that. Um, and that's part of kind of a new corporate citizenship. Yes, we expect you to make philanthropic donations in our community. Yes, we expect you to organize employee volunteer projects. But let's talk about um, other innovative ways that you can contribute. Aside from impact purchasing, a big thing that's happening in the Bay Area right now is I am saying to companies, lend me your money. I don't need, you don't even need to give it to me. Just lend it to me <laughs> at a very small rate of return, you know, two to three percent interest. And that is my source for building workforce housing. And you just saw Facebook announce a huge fund. You're about to see a bunch of other companies, tech companies in the Bay Area, announce these low cost capital funds for affordable housing construction. That, I think, is a great partnership. And, and I just have to say, I mean, we're mayors. I, I, I feel like really what we do is walk tight ropes every day because government cannot do it alone. We have got to use um, pr the private sector. We've got to. Uh, we don't. Do you, even with your high tax rates, do you have enough money to do all the things that you want to do in your city? No. No. Um, and at the same time, we're not going to prostitute ourselves to companies either. So it's kind of finding that line where we have um, a mutual interest. And I, I feel like this loan fund is a really interesting uh, model that other cities should look at in partnering with their corporate communities. There have <clears throat> been throughout the years mayor's funds that uh, mayors have created in bigger cities, Rahm Emanuel in Chicago. I got one. Do you have your own mayor's I fund? I do, I do. And how is it financed? Um, so, you know, actually, it's, it's a funny thing. I haven't officially launched it yet, so you're mm -hmm. all finding out about it here. Um, and yet we've run almost a million dollars of projects through it, which shows like what a need there is. So in Oakland, it's called the Oakland Fund for Public Innovation. And it is intended to be tied to our resilience plan. Mm -hmm. uh, Pittsburgh and Oakland are both part of the 100 Resilient Cities Network, which is kind of how we probably got to really know each other. Um, mm -hmm. I spend six months doing the public process to develop the budget for the city. That budget is in place for two years. Sometimes something happens within that two and a half years that needs a more immediate response. Or sometimes I have a crazy idea and it's, it's too risky to use the taxpayer dollar to try it out. But I can often convince someone in the private sector to fund a pilot, an experiment. Um, so we've set up this 501c3 that allows people to make tax deductible donations in the interest of advancing the city's work. And I'll give you uh, one example. We are really grappling with homelessness right now. Uh, it has just exploded and, and not, we've always had homeless people, but we have street encampments 
that are taking up blocks and blocks of sidewalks on the edge of our downtown, like right where people enter our downtown. And um, again, this was not something that we really had the opportunity to fully incorporate into our budget, besides the fact that really the county should be paying to address most of it. Uh, we went to the business community and they are helping fund um, these tough sheds. We're finding empty lots that are right next to where the encampments already are. And we're putting down these tough sheds. Uh, we have full-time uh, social services on site. We have a shower truck that, that visits. Uh, we are able to pop up porta potties and hand washing stations and garbage service and a community tent. Uh, but we've had a huge success. Uh, people are much more willing to move off of a street encampment and into these tough shed shelters where they have a lock and a key for their own space. They can bring their dogs, they can stay with their partners, and we're able to move these encampments as an entire community onto the tough shed shelter. Um, we were able to put those up quickly because we partnered with the private sector. And it, it sounds like a crazy um, pilot program, you know, with these sheds, but it's actually been really successful. Uh, we just started to open our second one this week, and without having a vehicle to do a quick kind of pilot innovation that's in partnership with the private sector, uh, we couldn't do these things. Innovation. Uh, you know, government needs R&D departments. <laughs> that's what we need. Um, looking at Wilkinsburg, I mean, obviously the revenues are tight. Um, Wilkinsburg is still under Act 47, I believe? Uh, no, we got out a couple years ago. Oh, well, well congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but still, it, it isn't that you yeah. have all this extra money left in your budget to be able to tackle all the other issues. Who are the partners that you look to? I mean, where are you able to find help when you find, find that program or you get that idea or someone in the community says, I'm willing to do this, where can you go to get that help to make it happen? So one of the great things is over the past four or five years of new leadership in the borough, the county has been an amazing, amazing partner in that to the point where over the past 18 months we've received over $1.8 million in funding to tear down um, around 119 properties throughout the borough. So if anyone drives through Ross, Penn, and South Avenue where all those streets merge, you'll see just a completely different landscape. So we've been fortunate in that aspect and then also understanding that we're a small community so we can't do necessarily some of the things that uh, Oakland you all are doing which are great I wish I had a notepad because everything you're saying I'm like oh I gotta remember and then in the city of Pittsburgh but one of the great things about our county is that we have over 130 municipalities many that are similar to Wilkinsburg so we really have been able to um, strengthen some of our ideas and find those partnerships in other communities. So for example, the COGS Council of Governments, we're in the Turtle Creek Valley. So we work with other municipalities such as Churchill, Forest Hills, Ed Edgewood, and we work together, whether it's salt sharing or some of the infrastructure things that we do, in addition to being a part of uh, Connect, which is Congress of Neighboring Communities ran out of Gispia at the University of Pittsburgh. And it's really just great because when we're dealing with the limited budget, as you said, even with our high taxes, we don't have money left over to tackle everything that we would that we want. If it was up to me, I would love to have a bulldozer to take down every dilapidated house, but we just don't have that right now. So we have to actually get innovative in how are we approaching funding, what can we do from what we have, and how can we work with other neighborhoods to do such. So one of the great things, um, I just always go back to the train station, because something that sat there vacant in our community for over 40 years. Now it's back in our hands and this can really be that anchor project that gets Wilkinsburg moving in the right direction. And that's something that, you know, really is our own because right now due to our population size and again needing growth, we're very much, um, we need collaborations on the regional level for all of us to succeed, for really the whole region to succeed. So it's really just a 
continued community of partnerships, but thankfully uh, similar neighborhoods and municipalities such as Wilkinsburg understand that collaboration is really the way that we're going to move things forward. So one of the great unreported stories of the past two years has been this movement through the Mon Valley of young leadership that has been taking over. And there are young mayors that were elected last year and the year before that are now the new leadership of the Mon Valley. And Wilkinsburg, obviously, you're, you're one of the top leaders of this movement. Uh, talk about that for a second, because I, I really think, you know, this is deserved to be a front page story that you had people who were elected for 40 years defeated by people in their 20s. Yeah. <laughs> So we need term limits, uh, but anyway, no. uh, thank you. It's just, it's really just about seeing what more your community could be. Seeing that, you know, for example, just how we got to such high taxes, that was just from, you know, not civic engagement, people not voting, because the same people were in for 20 years, but they didn't make efforts to, you know, reach out to the residents. And it goes both ways. Some of the residents maybe were apathetic and just said, okay, that's just how it is. So you get, you know, to a certain, and I think that's part of the millennial wave, so shout out to the millennials out there. But we see, you know, Things aren't what they were 30 years ago. 30, 40 years ago, you could tell someone will just get a job, you're gonna stay there for 30 years, you'll retire, have a nice retirement, all of these things. We're very much working with kind of different fragments. How can we piece together these things to make it work for us? You know, we have student loan debt, um, housing ownership is low because of student loan debt, jobs aren't paying what they used to all of those different things. And after a while, we can say, oh, I wish it was like this, or I wish someone would do something to address that. Well, at some point, you become that someone. You can't do something that you're not willing to do and ask someone else to do. So in the case of me, I saw that there needed to be change in Wilkinsburg. And while I was looking to see, well, who else is going to run? Who can I support? It was kind of like, well, you should just run for council and you should step up. And then that led to mayor. But I think you're seeing people aren't waiting their turn anymore. We're not waiting for people to retire from office or even die in office. We are now literally, that wasn't meant to be funny. I mean, it happens, but... Um, <laughs> But, you know, there's no more of that. And there were so many times when I first started, I was told to wait your turn. Like there was this line of like, oh, you have to wait till he steps down and then he has a successor in that. Oh, and, and Lord forbid you have little kids because then you get the you're a bad mom thing. I just I just had to put that. Yeah, down. but that's a very important point. <laughs> I don't have kids and I'm not married, but people will say, you know, well, when you get married, how do your husband going to feel about what? Like, what does that even mean? <laughs> when I ask them, like, no, no. No, <laughs> but all those different, all those different things. And so, the, um, so, you know, on one hand you have kind of the um, perspective towards millennials, but then let alone women as Mayor Schaff can understand just all the things that go along with that. And especially with the 2016 election, I think everyone's just tired that up and we're not you know playing nice anymore we're going to be the change that we want to see and now's the time so I don't think it's a moment I think it's a movement and it's just now kind of the natural order of things that you're going to continue to see younger people people of color um, you know more than your typical white men at the table you're going to start to see kind of what this room looks like more representative Austin Davis becoming the first African-American state representative yeah. to represent the Mon Valley in Absolutely. Pennsylvania history. Yeah. So we've got a little older group uh, <laughs> of mayors around the country that we like to hang out with and <laughs> steal ideas and share thoughts. And um, recently you made uh, international news with sanctuary cities and taking on Jeff Sessions and President Trump. I. Uh, just if you could talk about that network that we have as well. There, there, there are between uh, uh, the cities and the U.S. Conference of Mayors and the National League of Cities, uh, a network of 20 of us or so that sort of like, like each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I never thought that being the mayor of Oakland, I'd become the darling of Fox News. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I kind of, I love, I, I've, 
you know, we, we make decisions in split moments. You know, you get a piece of information, you have a very small amount of time to act on it. And I made a decision and I do not regret what I did. I, I will tell you, I did not anticipate kind of all the hubbub it would uh, cause and the fact that I have to have a very high priced lawyer to make sure I don't go to jail. Um, Luckily, she's working pro bono. Not, not, the taxpayers are not paying for her. Yes, people believe. <laughs> but I, w I really was heartened by a number of Republicans, and particularly Republican mayors, that reached out and said, um, regardless of what you feel politically, the federal government should not bully or tell a mayor who knows his or her community the best that what they have done is wrong. And so the US Conference of Mayors actually wrote a very stern rebuke. And it was, again, a bipartisan group. Um, but I wanna share something that came up in my conversation backstage uh, with Mr. Oliphant. Um, so uh, I, I also love community engagement. I do something called mobile mayor and I have like a little mayor's desk and a little stool and I, I literally drop it all over town, like in parking lots, on the sidewalk, at farmer's markets. And I was, and I, you know, I advertise where it's gonna be. It's not a secret. Uh, and I had a bunch of, I, you know, Trumpers show up to protest my, I'm sitting there in my little desk at the farmer's market and they have big American flags and signs that say lock her up and you know, so I was like, usually, in, o usually in Oakland it's like the left that is protesting so it was kind of weird to see the right in Oakland protesting. Um, but you know, I said this is mobile mayor, if you want to come talk to me one on one, you want your five minutes like everyone else, you're, you're welcome. And there is something that I uh, think we're sorely lacking on both sides of the political spectrum that happens when you have a one-on-one, -on -one, where you have a moment. And uh, the first guy walked up to me and he said, why are you putting these illegals in front of Americans like me? And um, I was struck because I heard what he was saying. And I said, I'm sorry if what I did made you feel that way, because it was not my intent to make you feel like you were behind anyone. I don't want anyone to be behind, be behind anyone else. In fact, that was the intent of what I did. But the, this, this feeling that others are being put in front and some are being left behind, ironically, that is so much of the angst that I hear in the gentrification and displacement debate going on in my city. And so um, I, I just thought that was an interesting realization that that pain uh, is being felt all over the place and that we need uh, more thoughtful uh, conversations about what's actually behind this. As we, we start to wind down, the, the one issue that I wanted to talk with both of you because you were both at the council member at the time and the mayor at the time in a situation where your community was ripped apart. Uh, dealing with P4, it's always about the people first. What do you do when you have a traumatic experience happen, a multiple homicide, a, one of the worst fires in American history. How do you work, because a community is like a person, it will go through anxiety, it will go through fear. What do you do, I and mean, what was, when you were in that situation, how was it that you were able to pull people together to be at their best when nature would have taken them to their worst? Yeah, that was um, a very difficult time. For those who may not know, two years ago in Wilkinsburg, March 2016, there was a uh, massacre that resulted in the loss of six lives, including one unborn child. So, and the um, majority of the victims were also women mothers. So, first, just kind of dealing with, you know, women and children aren't safe anymore, and how is this happening in our community? And I felt like I had been sucker punched, I'm not going to lie, and I was thinking, what am I doing is me being a council person even helping but when we all gather at the site and you're talking to people and then um, one great thing about Wilkinsburg we have a very strong interfaith community so we have leaders of the Muslim faith Catholic Protestant Baptist but we all came together and we just really 
talked about, you know, we sent our prayers and thoughts, but we just came together, banded as a community, and had to remind ourselves that things are still good and think good things are still happening here. We can't let this one time define us. If anything, we can't let these deaths be in vain. We can't just give up. So really, I can't even say how I led the community. The community more so led me and knowing that this is our community. We all are feeling the same thing, but we know we can't let ourselves, this can't be it. This can't be it. We have to continue the work. So I really found the strength in my residents and my neighbors and our leadership and our churches. Uh, and for me, it was the ghost ship fire uh, that happened a little more than a year ago where 36 people lost their lives. Uh, and these were mostly young artists, creative, um, amazing creative talents. Um, and this tragedy was not just one of, you know, this massive loss, but it really touched several nerves uh, of debate that are hot in Oakland. Gentrification, the fact that people can't afford to live in safe spaces, the fact that our artist community, the cultural soul of the city is being threatened in this moment of gentrification and, and that's such a value for us as Oaklanders. And so, you know, I felt like my job as a mayor was a few things. One, to articulate what our priorities were in the moment because the national press, they are vultures. They are heartless. <laughs> Just in case you didn't know. <laughs> um, and, and for, you know, they're like, you know, did you, the government, kill these people? Like, where are your inspection records? Like, did you fail? And you're like, my priorities right now are to complete the rescue of uh, any victims and the remains of people's loved ones that are in this building. My second job is to care for the friends and families of these victims. And your stupid ass shit is third on my list, okay? Um, so, and also by articulating the priorities in the moment, it really helps the organization because you're the leader of the organization and it helps center people because it is very overwhelming. Your other job is to be honest, not to make excuses and never to lie, to be truthful in these hard moments. And your third job is to show the path forward. And for me, I was very clear that I was not going to go on a witch hunt and shut down every artist live workspace in my city, that I was going to enhance safety, but I was going to do it in a way that minimized displacement. Uh, again, I pissed people off on both ends of the spectrum, but like I said, we walk those tight ropes, and when you articulate it, you, you explain why this is the path forward, um, whether people completely agree with you or not, they appreciate your clarity. Thank you. There's a lot of lessons between those incidents and all of the things that we're talking about today. I just want to thank you both for deciding to get into public service. It's an honor to serve with both of you and looking forward to working with you over these next few years. There's a lot of Wilkinsburg in Pittsburgh neighborhoods that can see the exact issues that you're talking about. And now we're starting to see the challenges that Oakland has been facing for the past several years in several Pittsburgh neighborhoods as well. And there's a lot of lessons we can learn from both. So thank you. Well, thank, thank you, you, Bill. You're a great model. Yeah. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.